Hello, everyone. Welcome to LDM. Uh, due to some, uh, some last-minute conflicts, Annie Duke will not be here today. But we have a very, very special treat for you. Um, I would give a long introduction, but I'm going to be very short. Everybody, this is Somic. Thanks, Noah. Uh, so I graduated from this department in 2010, and I was doing research on this title, Achieving Clarity on Value. And what I'm going to share today is a framework of decision quality. How many of you have taken a class on decision analysis? OK, some of you. Very good. So for those who have taken it, some of it will resonate. You, you would have seen some of it. But what, what I'm going to show you here is the innovation we are adding on to decision quality. And we've kind of expanded the framework a little bit. This framework has held good for at least 30 years. And I personally benefited very much from it. But we've added one more dimension. And you're probably one of the first people to see it. So it's still an evolution. So if you have ideas on how we can get clearer, that would be very much welcome. I'm going to start with a quick exercise for everyone. So I'm going to show you three statements. I want you to write down whether you agree or not. OK? Just note down. Statement A, the terrible situation in Iraq is proof that Bush made a bad decision in waiting it. OK? Just note down if you agree or not with this statement. Second one, I decided to break up with my boyfriend, and I'm so happy now. That shows my decision was good. Okay, note down if you agree with this kind of reasoning. Third one, the Columbia shuttle blew up, and therefore the decision to let it launch was a bad one. Okay. All right. Now I want to know how many of you agree with the first one. So don't just raise your hand. Close your eyes. We'll do a blind poll. Close your eyes. And how many of you agree with the first one, the decision to invade Iraq? The situation, terrible situation in Iraq is proof that Bush made a bad decision. If you agree, raise your hands. High up, please, so I can count. OK. Second one, I decided to break up with my boyfriend, and I'm so happy now. That shows my decision was good. How, how many of you agree with that reasoning? OK, very interesting. OK. And the third one, the Columbia shuttle blew up, and therefore the decision to let it launch was a bad one. How many of you agree with this one? Very interesting. OK, thank you. You can open your eyes. So the question here is, how do you judge the quality of a decision? And the fundamental premise of the decision quality framework is that you cannot judge the quality of a decision from the outcome. Because if you knew the outcome, you wouldn't have a decision to make. Let that sink for a moment. Now here's a simple way of understanding the difference between decisions and outcomes. You could make a bad decision. You could be driving drunk. And you could get a bad outcome. You could crash. You could also drive and arrive home safe while still being drunk. That's still a bad decision, but you got a good outcome. You got lucky. You could drive sober and still crash. That's a good decision, bad outcome. And you could drive sober and come home safe. That's fine. You, that's, that's, the kind of, that's the quadrant everyone wants to be in. But there's a distinction between decisions and outcomes here. So if you internalize this, this separation between decisions and outcomes and revisit, what would you say now? If you say the terrible situation in Iraq is proof that Bush made a bad decision, well, you, we're judging Bush's decision based on the outcome. Okay. Second one, I decided to break up with my boyfriend. I'm so happy now. That shows my decision was good. Again, it's the outcome that I'm so happy now that's being used to judge the quality of the decision. Many of you raised your hand. Most of you raised your hands for B. So anyone has any comments? Yeah? Well, the fact that the narrator thinks that that's the problem shows there actually probably was the problem. So the argument itself, the fact that she's making that argument also means that probably was a problem Probably, but the, the operative thing here is, it's the outcome that's being used to say, that shows my decision was good. Decision may have been good because that, that may have been the best thing she could have done at that point. But it's not because of the outcome. In fact, the quality of her decision must be judged before the outcome is evident. 
Because anyone can tell if it's a good or a bad outcome. There's no big deal, right? But the hard thing to do is to judge the quality of the decision. Okay? And the third one, interestingly, I saw some more hands here than you. Oh, another comment? Yeah. Well, you can judge the quality of the outcome because of the fact that you don't know what the alternative outcome would have been. Right? It could be a counterfactual. Very much, very much true. You, you can, that's an interesting point. So you could say that I might have done something different. That, that's a good, that's a strong reason to, to separate decisions and outcomes. I agree with you. Yes. And the third one, usually I, when I've done this in groups, very few people raise their hands for this one. And it's kind of interesting. So I have a little survey. I did this in an, in an online group of high school students. And I had a distribution like this. For the first one, a lot of people who felt that was a good, you know, a bad decision. Second one, they agreed with it, but very few agreed with this one. And when I asked them why, they, they came up with very interesting reasons. Why do you think I would see something like this? I saw something similar here. I saw most people, in fact, I saw a very similar distribution. I saw most people raise their hands for B, fewer people than this, and some people in this one. Why do you think I saw so many hands in the middle one? Yeah. Why you saw so few for C. Yeah, go ahead. Because people died and they wouldn't have if you didn't launch. Sorry? People died and they wouldn't have if you didn't launch, so you knew the outcome would have been better. Right. You, you know the outcome. The outcome quality was bad, but how do you know? Uh, why would so few people uh, agree that, or rather, why would so few people uh, not choose that option? As in, they disagreed with the characterization that this was a bad decision. They didn't, yeah. Because it was the case why people were involved in making the decision. Okay, that's a good one. Yes? I think maybe it's easier to separate the decision and the outcome with the Columbia one. It's uh -huh. like you couldn't have known, or may, maybe you could have known that it would blow up, maybe not. But that's such an extreme one, whereas like the relationship case, like I think uh, you were saying earlier, it's, it's kind of like you could maybe very easily foresee that you would be happier if you made this decision. And that's the reason you're making that decision. You are very good point. So, you, so your own experience comes to bear when you look at these situations. So we are biased by what we know in, in A and B. And A is all tends to be very emotional for a lot of people, so does B. Whereas C, you're not as emotionally invested, so you can be more objective about that. So our biases play a very big role when, when we are judging decisions and outcomes and they often trick us. And this is something that happens no matter where you are and what your level of education is. Here's another one, same thing. Write down if you agree or disagree with these statements. We've invested so much time in Afghanistan and all of that effort would have been for nothing if we pull out now, okay? I have invested so much time in my relationship and I don't want to move on or else all of that investment would be a waste. And we have spent so much money on tutors, and my skills have still not improved. Even though I believe the next tutor will succeed, I don't want to lose any more money on this. Okay? Okay, close your eyes. How many of you agree with the first one, pulling out of Afghanistan? Hands high. Okay. All right. How many of you agree with the second one? I have invested so much time in my relationship. We mistake to move on. Anyone? See, we have spent so much time on uh, and so much money on tutors, and my skills have still not improved. How many of you agree with this one? See some hands. Okay, thank you. So I didn't see too many hands going up here. Anyone wants to tell me why you didn't agree with any of these? Yeah. They're all so your decision should be based on what happened and what you think. Exactly. So these statements, all of them, violate the sunk cost principle which basically says the past matters only for learning, not for accounting. How much you've invested in the past is of no relevance except for the learning it can give you. you, you, you know, the, the person who could change the past has not yet been born. Let's put it that way. Okay? But it's good that most people are clear about this one. Um, so all of these, I would disagree with all three of them. And when I did this in the online survey, it was kind of interesting a lot of students thought or, or agreed with this one. And that's because these were high school kids. They're into the tutoring uh, space and emotionally invested in this. And they made a mistake here. So I'm going to skip this. 
So the next question is, how do you know you've made a decision? Anyone? Yeah. When you know what action you're going to take next. Okay. So suppose I know I need to buy, say, a Lexus car. Is that when I've made a decision? When you know that you've chosen the Lexus over some other option, then I would say yes. So I'm sitting, standing here, I say, I've chosen the Lexus over some other option. Have I made a decision? You say so? Well, I just spoke. I didn't do anything. I thought and I said, okay, I'm going to do it. But I haven't done anything. So what needs to happen for this to become a decision? Yes? You have to start executing on the ADA, doing something to... Yeah, I have to start executing. And something has to happen. Something has... Yeah. I can't take it back. I can't take it back. That's right. I mean, that's a very nice way of putting it. When you put in some resources, they'll never come back to you. Okay? Something is gone. It's money, time, energy. Even the money you put in now is not the same money that comes back to you later. So something of yours has to go forever, and that's when you know you've made a decision. And so that, and for the car buying example, it's the point at which you sign the dotted line with the dealership. The moment you've signed, that's it. The car is yours. Now if you change your mind, the dealership won't take it back without penalizing you for something. Say, so, well, this is a used car now. You've taken it. Okay. So these are some basic concepts. Next question, who's the best judge of a good decision? Any thoughts on this? Anyone? Yeah? Someone who's not involved. Some, someone who is? Who's, who is not involved. Who's, who's not involved. involved. Interesting, OK. Anyone else? Yeah? Someone who knows the decision maker's reasoning, or, or sort of saw how the decision maker went about the, the decision making. Okay, if you know what's going on. Yeah. The people who have to live with the decision. People who have to live with the decision. See, it's the decision maker. I mean, there's no way you can get into someone else's head. You, it's really the individual deciding for himself whether it's a good decision or not. But to Noah's point, when you're looking at other people's decisions, if you had to judge, you would have to really know what that person knew at that time. Only then you would be in some position to say, yeah, I think this, this was a good or a bad decision. But really the idea is to empower yourself to be making better decisions. So that's a brief uh, introduction. And one, since we've made the distinction between decisions and outcomes, the point is how do you judge? If you can't judge from the quality of the outcome, you have to use the process used to make the decision to make that determination that is this a good or a bad decision. So how do you do that? And so this is the framework I was referring to earlier, and I'm going to call it Cool Head Warm Heart. And this is guy, this is you, guy or girl, making the decision. And you're sitting on this stool, and those of you who have taken decision analysis will recognize this as the six elements of decision quality. We've changed it to only a slight bit. So the decision maker is sitting on a stool, which we call integration, which is integrating everything you know about the situation which includes alternatives, information, and values. And it's sitting on a frame that determines what you're, what you're looking at, your perspective. It should be also committed to action. So I'm going to go ahead and unpack each of these. And we may not get to finish all of it, but you'll at least get a starting point. So to begin with, the frame. How do you judge your frame? And what questions should we ask to judge your frame from a cool head and a warm heart perspective? So what is a frame? A frame is your window to the world. What's in, what's already decided, what's coming later, and what's outside. What, what's, what is it that you're not deciding right now? So having clarity on that is important. That, that's all part of framing. So here I have a question for you. So this actually came up in one of my earlier workshops where one of the students uh, had this decision question, which is, should I ask him or her out on a date? And this is the framework this person wanted help with this decision. And so if you think about it from a rational perspective, from a cool head, the question is, is this a useful question to ask? And from the heart perspective, is this a meaningful question to ask? And so if you, if you focus on the cool head part for a moment, what do you think? Is this a very useful question to ask? Does this give you clarity of action? Do you know what to do next? Well, this is just saying it's a yes or no answer, right? Should I ask him or I say yes, then what? Then you have to think again. 
right? It isn't clear what you should do or how you should act upon this information. This is more of a philosophical question. So it, there's nothing wrong with philosophical questions. It's just that it's not grounded in action. A much better question, a more useful question would be, where and when should I ask this person out on a date? And it's especially things like this where we're living in a culture where you don't get married to the first person you date. So yeah, of course, if you're, if you're thinking, should I ask this person out, the answer is yes. But the question is, when and where do you approach in a manner that's practical, that in a manner that's sensitive? That's a much more interesting question. That's useful. You can, you can take action on it. And that's the head speaking. Any comments? Well, let's try the heart. What if you look at it from, from a heart perspective? Is this a meaningful question to ask? And suppose you were to, you had the option to change the frame. Could you ask this question in a slightly different way? How would you bring some more heart to this question? This is all about logistics. Where, where should I ask this person? Where's the heart in this? What are you really after? Well, what about this question? How can I get to know this person at a deeper level? And if that's what you're really after, dating is one way of finding out. There are other possibilities as well. What other ways it, can you think of? You know, how would you advise someone who's asking you, how can I get to know this person at a much deeper level? Okay. What comes up in your mind? I'm sure some of you have dated by now. <laughs> <laughs> Any ideas? Oh, come on. Don't be shy. This is, these are very important questions. Well, you, you start off by trying to talk to him or her, um, ask some questions. Uh, you find out what right? his or her interests are. Right. Maybe look deeper into them. Yeah. You can have a very casual conversation. You don't have to make it a formal date. You could also do service projects. You, if, you, if there are certain values you want to check, are they compatible? You could try to find out, well, what activities would bring out those values? And does this person want to join me on some project that brings out those values? And that way you can find out more, much more about a person than you know, data is just one way of doing it, and there are many other ways. So the point here is the way in which you ask the question changes the answers you're going to get. So one was a logistical question. The other is more of a brainstorming question on different things you can think of. So that's about questioning the frame. So anytime you face a decision, you need to question the frame and ask yourself, is this the right question? So in summary, the head aspect of the frame is, is it useful? The heart aspect is, is it meaningful? Does it touch a deeper element of who I am? Let's get into alternatives now. So alternatives is about what can I do? So I have this situation where I ask my wife, honey, do I look fat in this shirt? And she wants to tell me, it's not the shirt, you look fat in everything you wear. <laughs> so what are her alternatives? What do you think she... <laughs> okay, this is... So having had personal experience, uh, uh -huh. not in that, exactly in that context, my wife typically says, you know, that's not the best choice. You know, so she, she won't you know, totally diss me. So, but she'll say, you know, that's really not the best shirt for you. So it's a close-change shirt, but that's one alternative. What other alternatives are there? Yes? You could lie. She could lie. She could say, well, you look wonderful. <laughs> what else would she do? Yeah. I like to answer the wrong question. Uh -huh. So it, do I look fat in this? And you, you just say something. You don't answer the question. You say something else that's nice. Like, yes, I do. Uh, I appreciate you regardless of how you look. That's a great one. That's a, that's a very interesting one. So, so from the head perspective, your alternatives need to be creative and doable. From the heart perspective, they're about intriguing, you know, they really get you at a deeper level. They are exciting alternatives that you hear them, we're like, oh my God, I, I really want to try this out. And so the, some of the ones that came up, you'd better change it to another shirt or you look wonderful. And here's the blunt one, it's just, sorry, it's not the shirt, it's you. <laughs> That's a little heartless. But these are all you know, possibilities. But if I bring some heart into it and say, well, maybe it's the wrong question. It's as Noah said, she could tell me, well, if you really ask me whether I love you, the answer is yes, and it has nothing to do with how fat you are. Now, are you still interested in whether you look <laughs> fat in the shirt? So usually when people ask these sorts of questions, if the question is not what they're asking. They're looking for some kind of affirmation. 
And again, you know, your alternative is not to accept the frame, but to go deeper. And that's open to you. Here's another one. So someone comes and tells me, or anyone else, you are, a, and put in the worst, filthiest word you can imagine. Okay, someone's really insulted you now, right? And I hear this and I want to beat the hell out of this person. What are my alternatives? From a cool head and a warm heart perspective. Let's, let's take the cool head first. What could I do when I, somebody, somebody just come and insulted me and I feel really bad about it? Yeah. Smile and say thank you. Smile and say thank you. <laughs> or no thank you. Indeed. So I could say, no, you're mistaken. You know, you said I wish I said I'm not. Right? So that's a clear and doable alternative, you know, and I can just walk away without feeling hurt. That's one level. And I think it's good as far as it goes. But I could deepen it. I could say, well, oh, that was a cannonball that flew over my head. I wonder what made you say that. And this is at a different level, right? Now I'm really genuinely interested. And I'm honoring the full truth of the situation. This person, you know, threw a shell, but guess what? Because I allowed myself to duck. It didn't hit me personally, and I'm really interested. What happened? And I don't know where this is going. It's not tied to any particular decision, but it is a decision to be interested in other people. So that's a, an, uh, an altogether different level. Let's try another one. So you guys like stories? Yeah? yeah? All right, okay, I'll tell you a story. So there's this guy. This guy is the head of a dorm, and he, you know, he's, he's building a new dorm. Okay, so he's got the architect, and he says, you give me the plans, and then he shows it to the dorm folks, you know, the kids, and he says, check the plans and give me your feedback. And so he says, well, thank you all for listening to our architect's plans for the new dorm. Any suggestions from the students? And the head of the student committee says, yes, we feel strongly about having unisex toilets. And the chairman of the committee says, oh, oh, what's he thinking? What's he worried about? Any ideas? Well, let me ask a question to the girls in the audience. How many of you have brothers? Any girls have brothers here? Nobody? Okay, there's some. Okay. Do your brothers keep the toilets clean? Or do no, okay, I see that's shaking. Well, so generally, you know, the chairman who's wise in the ways of the world, he knows that this is gonna fail because women like clean toilets and men can't keep toilets clean. <laughs> So the girls are going to come kicking and screaming, saying, this is a bad idea, we want to switch back. But then you would have already made a big toilet, now you have to invest in separating them out. So it's a big headache, it's a financial headache for him. So that's one thing that he's worried about, that we'll have to rebuild the toilets, because this is going to fail. At the same time, he, he wants the students to have this learning experience on their own. He doesn't want to convince them out of this. What can he do which allows the students to learn, and at the same time, it protects his, you know, his financial responsibility. It, it doesn't get him down the wrong path. What do you think he could do? Make, yeah. Make two restrooms and make both of them. Uh, yeah. Basically yeah. 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 Indeed. So instead of creating one, you create two restrooms and label both of them unisex toilets. And later, when people are screaming and you know complaining, just switch the labels. That way, you don't have to rebuild them. And what we just did there is we created an option. And an option is a very special decision. It gives you the right to change your mind in the future. And so when you're dealing with alternatives, it's, it's really important to be mindful of creating options for yourselves. That's another learning point about alternatives. And this is also intriguing because now you've respected, you really want people to learn on their own. At the same time, it's smart to do it this way. Okay? So in summary, alternatives, when you're, when you're thinking about decisions, think about have you been creative enough, have you, ha have you put feasible alternatives on the table, and are they intriguing, are they deepening, are they exciting? Let's get into information. So this is about what do I know, and so let's imagine the situation where the doctor tells you, I know this test is disgusting, but I want you to take it. Do you have any questions for me? Okay, so if, suppose you're facing this, and it's a really disgusting test that you'd rather not speak of, but you can imagine the worst, and it's for your own good. It'll help the doctor diagnose what's wrong with you. What should you be asking the doctor? <coughs> what information can she get? Yeah. Why is it disgusting? Oh, it's you. She's going to tell you graphic detail. I mean, come on. Use your imagination. How would I be affected by 
Oh, you'll be traumatized. <laughs> 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 You'll be traumatized and we'll give them information about your condition, yeah. What are you, you going to learn from it? What are you going to learn about the, about the condition you have? Can I do anything about it? Who, Once you who's learn that? Me as the patient. No, but the, you know, you, you're just the patient, right? The yeah. doctor is the one who's going to administer, administer treatment. Are you asking, can the doctor do something about it? So, uh, is the doctor asking me this? Is that like... She's saying that to Yeah, me. she's saying that to you. Now, you, you have the opportunity to ask her a question. What would you ask her? Do I have any other options? <laughs> no. <laughs> Just to make it fun. But you're on the right track. Is there some course of action that I can take that this information... Is, this, is the information material? Uh, what do you mean by material? Uh, will knowing one result or another change the decision I'm going to make? Ah. So, you could ask the doctor, what would you do differently depending on the result of the test? And I kid you not, this came up. So, when I was a TA in decision analysis, one of the students in my class, he, said he had taken the class and he'd been trained to ask this question. And his son was, uh, you know, they suspected him, the, the baby to have H1N1. And so, the doctor wanted a very painful test done poking the kid. And so, he asked this question, well, will you change your treatment? And the doctor said, no. He says, well, I don't want you to poke my baby then. <laughs> I said, no, it's a government regulation. You've got to do it. And then he, he couldn't get out of it, unfortunately. But I think what happened there was somewhat illegal. But this is a very important question. <laughs> you, you should definitely ask the doctor, if you're not going to change your course of treatment, I don't want the test. It doesn't make any difference. Okay? There are other questions you can ask. For instance, what, how good is the test? You know, for positive cases of this disease, what fraction of the test has reported it as positive? And similarly, what fraction is negative? These are all about the, the, the strength of the test. These are good questions to ask. Let me go back to the example of you know, being abused, and I want to be the hell out of this person. What are my alternatives? And when, I, when you ask a question like this, you're really asking for open-ended information. You don't know where this is going to lead you. And so that's a crucial distinction between the head and the heart. The head closes things down and gets you incisive clarity. The heart opens up into spaces that you could never imagine. And both are very important. And so this is a different kind of inf information. It's not going to close it. It's going to teach you something new. So that's the heart perspective on this. So in summary, information should be reliable, relevant. It should, be, you know, should give you incisive information. And in the heart perspective, it should be interesting, exploratory, surprising perhaps. These are all heart elements. Okay. We get to values. How many of you recognize this? All right. So who are we seeing here? Alice, Alice in Wonderland. So she's talking to the Cheshire cat, and there's this conversation where Alice asks the cat, would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? And the cat responds, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. And Alice says, I don't much care where. But the cat says, then it doesn't matter which way you go. Alice continues, so long, so long as I get somewhere. The cat says, oh, you're sure to do that if you only walk long enough. And so the bigger comment here is, for those people who believe that every outcome is the right outcome, there's no decision to be made. But for many of us who believe we have some influence over our outcomes, it's very important to know what we want. Because without that, you cannot figure out which way you need to go. So values is about knowing, A, what do you want, and B, who you want to be. These are two elements of it, from the head and the heart. So... The first one is about your preferences in a particular decision context, about how much you want something. And the second is about who you want to be. It's far more inspirational. Um, and going back to this example, the shirt example, this is really about the heart. It's about the person you want to be. Right? So if my wife wanted to just be superficial, she could have chosen the other alternatives, or she could have lied to me. But she, if she wanted to be authentic, this is the kind of answer she would be thinking about. Here's a true story from when I was, I think I was in 11th grade. So something happened, and there's a friend, and we, you know, somehow one of us insulted the other, whatever it is, and, and this guy dared me to a fight in front of everybody. And so here we are standing eyeball to eyeball before the first blow is given, and I pause and think, okay, what should I be thinking in a situation like this? You're in this situation, you've been insulted, you've got a fight, and there you are standing. What should you be thinking? Yeah? I mean, 
how likely are you to win the fight? Is it important to you to fight? What are the consequences? Very nice. So, can I really win? So that's like reliable, useful information. This is the head thinking, right? So I was thinking, this guy's about the same size as me. So both of us are going to get hurt in this. I'm not going to be able to win. So that doesn't sound too good. Do I want to get hurt? My preference is no, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> How do I get out of this? <laughs> I need some creative alternatives to save face and get out. So that's the head talking. But the heart has a different conversation, and that's really about who I want to be. And I really didn't want to hurt this guy. It, you know, I don't like the idea of violence. I just found myself stuck there. So then the question is, what can I do to make it cool for both of us to get out of this situation? <laughs> And so what ended up happening was I said, look, dude, you're a strong guy and I can't beat you. But if you swing, so will I, and both of us will be hurt. Since neither of us can win without getting hurt, there's no point fighting. Why not go back to our seats? He grinned at me and said, good idea. <laughs> and the matter ended. And it's kind of interesting. <laughs> it was a good decision, good outcome, I'd say. <laughs> Sorry? Wasn't that the Cuban? Cuban. <laughs> 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 So in a lot of situations where we find, it's interesting, when I gave this question to the high school kids, the answers I got was, well, you got to assess, can you take him out with one blow? <laughs> or how quickly can you end the fight and you know, who else is there? I was like, well, what if you change the frame a little bit? So it's kind of interesting. When you think about your values, it kind of takes you in a different direction. And it's very interesting when the two of them align. Here's another one. Uh, where should we take our company in the next five years? And this one uh, is from a real life example. In fact, we had this very interesting experience with a packaging company. And this company, uh, this of course, you know, is accountable to shareholders and all of that. So we did a values exercise for them. And what we found was they cared about four things just because, as in at the intrinsic level. And one of them was they wanted people to have clean and safe water. Second, they wanted people to have high quality natural packaging, less plastic. Third, they wanted people to have access to basic necessities of life, and their packaging would make it possible. And the fourth one was they wanted to reduce spoilage in the world, because a lot of, uh, a third of the food in the world just goes bad, because there's no way to preserve it. And when they came up with these four values, they got so inspired. The funny thing was, the four values became their strategy. It became their strategic filter. In fact, the, 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 the clarity from that was they would only take up opportunities that was in the intersection of all of these four values. They would still be a responsible business, but in service of their values. So, so this, is, this is a very inspiring way to lead a company, and people in, in such organizations just come alive at work. So that's another way in which that can play out at the organizational context. And of course, the head part is, how can we sustainably serve the world? That's a very important question. Uh, I have some videos, but I won't have time to play them right now, so I'm going to skip these. But the slide deck will have the link so you can watch the very inspiring videos of how companies like Southwest and Apple have thought about values. In particular, Apple, Steve Jobs has this inspiring session where he says, marketing is all about values. So that's the summary of values. This is about preferences. That's about the inspiration that drives you. Let's get to integration. And looking at the time, I'm going to run through this a little quickly. So here, the head part of integration is logic. How do you put everything together to come at a sensible decision? And the hard part is, are you taking everyone along? What's the narrative you've got that really moves people and helps them see what has to be done? And I'm going to skip some of these things for lack of time. But we can get back to it if we have time in the end. Um, the logic is, is pretty much the focus of the decision analysis class. And there we have the TAs of decision analysis. They know all about this stuff. So I highly recommend that you take this class and learn about this. I'm going to skip this. And I'm going to get to the narrative. And the narrative is logic is not enough to move people. People need to see a reason behind it. It's got to connect with their hearts. And that's what helps them to give up what they're stuck on and move forward. And I have a very small clip. I'm going to play two minutes of that clip. So this is uh, when Steve Jobs had just come back to Apple. And he, uh, had to he basically killed a whole bunch of products, and people were very upset with him. And so this is two minutes from the uh, Worldwide Developer Conference for Apple. And he, he's just gotten a nasty question from someone. He's basically got a question about why they killed 
the open doc format. Yeah. Well, you know, let me let me say something. This this sort of generic. I know some of you spent a lot of time working on stuff that we put a bullet in the head of. I apologize. I feel your pain. But Apple suffered for several years from no fr from lousy engineering management. I, I have to say it. And there were people that were going off in 18 different directions doing arguably interesting things in each one of them. Good engineers, lousy management. And what happened was you look at the, the, the farm that's been created with all these different animals going in different directions, and it doesn't add up. It, the, the, the total is less than the sum of the parts. And so we had to decide what are the fundamental directions we're going in, and what makes sense and what doesn't. And there were a bunch of things that didn't. And microcosmically, they might have made sense. Macrocosmically, they made no sense. And you know, the hardest thing is, you, when you think about focusing, right? You think, well, focusing is, is saying yes, no. Focusing is about saying no. Focusing is about saying no. And you've got to say no, no, no. And when you say no, you piss off people. And they go talk to the San Jose Mercury, and they write a shitty article about you. You know? And it's really a pisser. Because you, you want to be nice. You don't want to tell the San Jose Mercury the person that's telling you this, you know, just was asked to leave, or this or that, or this or that. So you take the lumps. And Apple's been taking their share of lumps for the last six months in a very unfair way. And it's been taking them, you know, like, a, like an adult. And I'm proud of that. Uh, and there's more to come, I'm sure. There's more to come. I mean, some of these, I read these articles about some of these people that have left. I know some of these people. They haven't done anything in seven years. And, you know, they leave and it's like, you know, it, it's like the company's going to fall apart the next day. And, and so, you know, I think there'll be stories like that that come and go. But focus is about saying no. And the result of that focus is going to be some really great products where the total is much greater than the sum of the parts. And um, OpenDoc, I mean, I was for putting a bullet in the head of OpenDoc. A, I didn't think it was great technology, but B, it didn't fit. The rest of the world isn't going to use OpenDoc. And um, I think as a container strategy, there's some stuff in the Java space that's much better. And even the OpenDoc guys were basically trying to rewrite the whole thing in Java anyway, and which was a restart. So um, it didn't make sense. So there you have Steve Jobs explaining a, a very uh, tough decision on many developers who were involved with this technology. And he has a narrative which says we've kind of lost our way and we've got to focus. And this is to a community of developers who basically are going to write software for the Apple platform to make it valuable. Unless he takes them along, Apple is not going to be successful. So the narrative is a critical and very important part of integrating and recognizing that we're working with a whole bunch of other people who need to buy into the logic that you've used to figure out what your strategy is. So the head and the heart have to align there. Any thoughts, any quick comments? Okay, so the summary on integration is <laughs> integration requires having good sound logic and it also requires having a good narrative that takes the community along. The last part is commitment to action. And the head part of this is, what are my action plans? How am I going to actually execute on this? So there's a lot of planning that, that emanates from a commitment to action. You, you need to get very, very concrete. And people have different ways of arranging this, of personal decisions. You know, having a simple to-do list goes a very long way in actually getting things done. In a business environment, you have all kinds of project management systems that help you deliver the value that you've committed to. The hard part is equally interesting. I'm going to show you another video. And this one's a, a little bit funny. I mean, it's for those who haven't seen it, this might surprise you. So we'll just watch it real quick.
the idea there, the stampede. So what do you think happened there? Any thoughts on what you just saw? Yeah. There was like less risk every time another person joined in the dance. Yeah. So yeah. the first person was taking the biggest risk, but uh -huh. he probably didn't really care because he was doing it, having fun. And then, yeah, I don't know, kind of just piled on eventually. Yeah. But could this have happened without the first person jumping in? So you need someone to start. Could this have happened without the other guys? Who was just as important if not, you know, yeah, second the second guy, yeah. Who else? The third guy. <laughs> so, so we are talking about two very important things. One is leadership and the other is followership. And leadership get, gets talked about a lot in the media, but not too many people talk about followership. Without, if everyone's a leader, nothing will ever get done. So the, the hard aspect of commitment to action is someone deciding to lead in, with the inspiration of the moment and others deciding to follow. And it's an amazing thing to follow. That's when you get great things done as well. So that's another important element in, in the last part of the framework. So now what we find is there's, there's usually a knowing doing gap. And Professor Bob Sutton has a whole book on this subject. Uh, in, in the Department of Management Science and Engineering, so we know what's good for us, but we still don't do it. You know, we, we know we should be jogging every day, but we don't. <laughs> so how do we fix this? And how do we get more aware of our choices? And that's really the open question um, that I want to, want to leave you with. You know, what are some ways in which you might become more aware of the possibilities, or that even, even that you have a decision? Some of these examples are about sticky situations where a lot of people don't realize they have a decision to make. So with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. And we can go back to any part if there's anything you want me to go back to or cover. <coughs> or any thoughts or reflections, comments. Yeah. Do you, do you assess the quality of a decision um, just prior to it being made? And what, what if the answer to your quality decision is it's not a quality decision? Do you still make it? Only, so for, first, only you would know the quality of your decision. And if you knew you were making a low quality decision, perhaps you should be thinking of making the decision not to make a decision. Say, well, I don't have enough information. Or I need to make, you know, create more alternatives for myself. Maybe I need to get some help from someone else in thinking through this situation. So all of these are in the realm of possibilities. No one's forcing you to make the decision. So you, you would disagree with the premise that a bad decision is better than no decision? No, I think there are two uh, aphorisms there. One is don't just stand there, do something. And the other is don't just do something, stand there. And I think at different points of your life, different ones become more valuable. So you, you'll have to determine where you are, you, are you just acting mindlessly without regard to what you really care about? And if so, it might be better to slow down and observe and, and reflect, what do I really want? What can I do? What do I know? And then make a much more thoughtful decision. And if you're in, you know, the kind of person who's always into philosophy, never getting anything done, then maybe it's time to accelerate and, you know, do something real and learn from action. So we, we shift in our life between phases. Yeah. Why did you explore expanding the decision quality framework? You know, what was it in your professional um, life that you were seeing that made it or compelled you to explore this? Uh, for, for given that the decision quality framework has existed for 30 years, yeah. why, why now? That, that's a fantastic question. Why did, why did we choose to expand this? Well, what I discovered was the people I admired in decision analysis, people who would go out in the field and do framing, they were short selling themselves by saying this is all about rational decision making or that this is about finding the best alternative. What they were actually doing with their actions was connecting to what people really wanted. And, and if you, you have to just see some of these folks in action. It's a treat to watch. 
they, they will connect to what people really care about, inspire them, and get them to really get excited, and then you know, structure all of that inquiry with the logic of decision analysis. So there's this whole you know, thing, a you know, very rich set of things they were doing, which is not being captured by the language of our framework, which let me see if I have, yeah. It wasn't very well captured with this. I mean, it was, this was extremely important. But there's this other stuff that they were tapping into, but they were not articulating. And I feel that in decision analysis has, has somewhat short-sold itself. They, they do an extremely great job of this, the practitioners, but this needs to be articulated because this matters. This is what moves people forward. And if you just do this, it's very dangerous. I mean, as they say, you know, the, the, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. So you feel a lot of these warm, this warm and fuzzy stuff, but your head is somewhere else, and then it's a lot of trouble in the world. On the other hand, if it's all head, it doesn't really get you, it doesn't really move you to act. And what in, in, in business organizations, so it's been a very big learning experience for me. I, I, I thought initially that businesses wouldn't care about the warm and fuzzy stuff. In fact, I find that this stuff is actually central. This is what, you know, why people come or you know, show up to work every day. And I would even argue that most companies that call themselves for profits are actually confused. Because if you ask them, you know, are you really coming here to make money? They'll say, yeah. And I say, well, what if I give you a check? For the amount of money you're going to make, the, the, the deal is you, you cannot work. And almost everyone I've tried this with say, no, no, no I, don't, I don't want that check. I like what I do. Well, then, so you're not coming here just for money. Money is, in fact, the reason that, that allows you to come to work, that allows you to do what you love, come alive. So money is extremely important. It should be honored. These are resources. But the money is here for you. You're not here for the money. You're here to do something amazing and spectacular. And these resources... You know, sensible resource management allows us to do it, allows us to pull it off. So we need this stuff on the left, but the stuff on the left is really here to, to help us do what's in here on the right. Personal ideas. But I found whoever I speak to, they resonate. This is not an original thing at all. You know, everyone I talk to is like, you shouldn't be, if, if you're doing what you love, you'd be crazy to be in a profession that actually does this full time because Usually, most of the things we do, like write software, it's, it's really hard. It's so crazy difficult that you'd have to be madly in love with software development to make it your profession. And yet, people do it. And the money helps them do it. So that's a beyond profit perspective is what I would call it. Profit is important, but it's, it's not the only thing. It's instrumental. Any other thoughts, comments? Uh oh, that's my boss. Sorry, I, I've been, I'm David Madison, I've been doing decision analysis for probably 20 years. He's been doing it for more. Uh, this is Jim Madison next to me. Um, but I, I think just to speak to this last point, uh, I spent a lot of time doing analysis that nobody cared about. And the decision analysis framework is great for setting a direction, uh, but, it, you know, maybe, but it won't power something forward. And I think the decision analysis of this may be a bit theoretical, but getting to the right decision is not the objective. The objective is to align people on the right answer or something that's going to be in their interest. And you can't power the alignment unless you connect to something people care about. The stuff on the right, I've certainly learned the hard way. It would have been great if someone had a framework for me that I can start with. So you need the you need the electricity, which is the right, but you also need the direction, which is the left, and it's the bringing together of those two things that I think makes uh, decision analysis interesting and actually possible in a practical setting. Yes. Um, I'm curious about followership because uh -huh. um, it seemed like the the first dude who was dancing. And he was doing his thing, yeah. and it was the, the like the second and third ones who like had clothes on and looked a little more normal that sort of got the everybody dancing there. Yeah. Um, what what are your and we also talk about leadership all the time yeah. around here. So like, what what are your thoughts on followership? Here? I think the second, the third, all the way down to the nth follower is just as important in creating a movement of of any lasting change. And there is another term I've heard in this space, which is called servant leadership, where you, you kind of turn it upside down. 
where you, you're really looking at service as a much bigger ideal than establishing your ego in a place. And that just flips the whole thing around, that you're here to serve the world. It makes followership a much, more, much easier idea to accept. You're not, you're, it's, it's, a, it's a paradigm shift, but when, once you try it out, it, it doesn't matter who, whose idea it is. It's just, is it in service of my values? And that's where the values become really important. And if it is, then you know, we're dancing the same dance. It doesn't matter where it began or where it ended. In fact, you can't even tell. Now what we're discovering is you know, people's thoughts, you know, they, they get shared. And you know, oftentimes, you'll find the same space, people having the same thoughts, and, you know, people being inspired in the same way. You know, it's like with mirror neurons, we find that if I smile at you, then you somehow smile, he's smiling back. So who started the smile and who ended it? These are all you know, not very useful questions. But the, the operative thing is we're all smiling. We can smile together. We can actually make some positive change happen. And, and I think the, the thing that powers everything is our values. If you find, OK, this is something that's truly important to the world. It lets you get outside of your ego. That just has some generative energy. And when you're working with a, with a client there, the packaging company, the, when, they, when they thought about the good they could do in this world, it just made them emotional. It's like, yeah, we want to do this. We want to be proud of coming to work every day. And that emotional energy is, is very much prevalent. I feel, I feel that our language, our business language, has kind of prevented our thinking and trapped our thinking quite a bit. But what I find is people are usually struggling with that limiting language. Everybody understands this. You have a little short conversation. They say, oh, yeah, these things, yeah, and, and, they, and they feel liberated. And you say, yeah, you can express it in this way. Oh, oh really? Oh, wow, that's fantastic. Never heard of this before. But this, is, this sounds true. Sounds true because it's not original. It's the oldest idea in the world. Every tradition, every culture stands up for, for the alignment of the head and the heart. And our business language needs to catch up with it. Any other? OK, are we out of time? Or? Yeah, we're, we're a little over, actually. OK, well, thank you so much for listening. And So I do want to point out there is some, you know, if you, if you please have a conversation about decision analysis, we have the TAs, Onder, Noah, and we have Steve here, and we have Professor Schachter who's walking out. He's, he's the guy who, <laughs> he teaches the class on decision analysis. And a lot of the examples, um, uh, you, you can really, I have directly been inspired by him, on especially the shirt example. It comes from him. <laughs> he, he, he shared that over a TA lunch. And I was so deeply uh, moved that I had to include it in my deck. And Clint here, he's been a VC and he's a, an ex alum, PhD alum in decision analysis. Of course, with my boss, David Matheson, Jim Matheson. Jim's been in the field for uh, how many decades now? Forever. Five, Five decades. And David has been, David's been doing a heck of a lot of work with, I mean, I mean all my stuff are framing, all of this stuff really, it's a collaboration with David. So, and so we're inspired by a lot of stuff that goes on here. We're kind of channeling it. It's not really original stuff. It's all co-created. So thank you for coming. And please have some interesting conversations. Find out more about this field. Highly encourage all of you. No, that's not all the ones in the room. Uh, yeah. We've got Mike. We've got Jason. We've got, I think she was over there. I see you, she. All right. Um, all, all, uh, all members of the decision analysis community. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>